I'm Michael Killen, and recently I was at Stanford University with the head of sustainability and energy management for the entire complex of 800 buildings. And during that discussion, Joe Stegna said to me that the minister of France was visiting him, the chairman of a huge, huge French company called Energy de France was visiting him. And I asked, what for? And he said to me, Michael, we have developed a certain kind of system or an aspect of it that provides greater energy efficiency than Stanford has ever been able to attain and many other companies have never been able to attain. And that got me interested in that system because I am working on making a painting of California's goal number three, which is to double the energy efficiency savings in existing buildings. And then Joe said to me, you ought to talk to a woman from Energy de France named Amy Bailey. She can give you even more insights into the system. Ladies and gentlemen, my interview is with Amy Bailey. Amy, thank you for being here. Thanks very much for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Good. And you are a doctor. Yes. A physicist. Yes. And Not a medical doctor. <laughs> and what is your thesis? What, is, what was it on? Mm. So I was focused on the subfield of physics called condensed matter theory uh, and in specific soft matter. Uh, and so most of my research was on polymers and also biological systems. And I developed different theories for the behavior of those systems and then tested those theories using computer simulations. Anyone who develops theories, I have to respect because it takes original thinking and it takes a lot of knowledge of what is going on. Now, please, before I ask you some questions about what you're doing and also Stanford's uh, breakthrough system. Um, tell me something about the company you work for. Sure. So uh, we normally just go by the initials EDF, but um, the full name is Electricité de France. Uh, and it's a very large energy company, like you said. Um, actually, it was developed after World War II. Um, as a vertically integrated uh, electricity utility serving all of France. It's a state-owned company. Um, but since that time, it's uh, grown into a very large uh, multinational energy conglomerate. So EDF is active in pretty much every part of the energy value chain um, in pretty much every part of the world. So when you say that about EDF, they make equipment? So within France, um, they are the ones that developed the nuclear fleet. Uh, it, it's effectively like a municipal utility, but at a national scale. And so that was kind of their, their start, um, building the nuclear fleet to power uh, the restoration of France after World War II. Um, but in addition to having that generation, you also have to transmit and distribute that generation to uh, communities. Uh, and so they also did the transmission and distribution of that electricity um, and also the retail sale to the customers. Um, that is kind of the old utility model. Uh, and since then, in the 90s, a lot of um, the energy sector has been uh, deregulated and, and uh, separated, the generation, transmission, and distribution and retail components. And the same is true for EDF. And so there are a couple so-called regulated uh, affiliates um, that are the transmission and distribution and then they have some non-regulated affiliates that do energy efficiency services. Here in the U.S. they're best known for building uh, utility scale renewable plants. Oh, utility, great. Well, those uh, renewable plants are big solar operations with some storage, maybe some wind, something of that nature. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that after World War II, the French took the approach 
for rebuilding, and they decided to use nuclear. And, uh, and I have often heard, you know, in, in the United States, there's a lot of people who are fearful of nuclear for waste or for explosion. But then on the other hand, I know an awful lot of physicists, they say they could sleep at night if California embraced nuclear energy because it would help the economy and at the same time it would significantly reduce the threat of climate change. So, and then you made this comment about they deregulated, which makes me think now parts of energy to France uh, has competitors. Yes. Okay, I think I got it. And they do business in the United States. Yes. And, and it's new, uh, utility grade size plants. Right. So the main affiliate here, the, the largest one, is EDF Renewables, um, which is based in San Diego. And so they um, design, uh, build, and also operate and maintain large uh, wind plants and also solar plants. Uh, in addition to utility scale, I think like a lot of um, a lot of uh, energy companies, they're also getting more and more active on the distribution system. And so there's also a team within EDF Renewables that offers services to like commercial and, and, and industrial customers if they want to install solar on their roof or if they want to install solar plus storage uh, EV chargers. And so uh, I think a lot of a lot of energy companies are, are really diversifying the types of services they're offering. All right, that's helpful. Now, I started the interview by saying Stanford developed something of significance. And I mean, Stanford even says they're the leader in this type of field, worldwide leader, and it's very beneficial. Um, and what can you tell me what makes, not what makes it so important, what Stanford did, and we'll get to what they did, but what's some of the results mm. that would really assure us that Stanford has something that's worth us focusing on? Mm. Yeah, I think that's really the place to start, uh, the results they've achieved. So they have a system that enabled them to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by almost 70%. Oh, come on, that's 70%. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it really, I mean, uh, it really is the case that they are global leader in this sort of uh, system design. I haven't, uh, I'm not aware of another system design quite like it, although maybe, maybe there is one out there, but I haven't, uh, I haven't seen it. And so in addition to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, I mean, they were able to do that because of how efficient the system is. And they achieve that efficiency through heat recovery. Right. Yeah. Before we get into how they did it, I mean, there's some people in this country who couldn't care less if anybody reduced greenhouse mm -hmm. gas emission. What about the cost of energy? Right. Yeah, that's, um, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so in addition to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, uh, they also saved money. Uh, and so their system, which over the course of a 35 year uh, lifetime, will save them around $400 million, and which is a significant percentage of the overall system costs. So it reduced greenhouse gas emissions, it saved money, and also another environmental impact, one that we're, of course, very sensitive to in California, is water. Um, the old type of system they had used a lot of potable water. I think it was around a quarter of Stanford's water, potable water usage. The new system uh, reduced water usage by 18%. Okay, so let me see if I remember the numbers. Stanford has put a system in place that reduces energy uh, reduces uh, carbon emissions by 70 percent yes okay and they have invested I think uh, half a billion 500 million in their system and they're going to save over 35 years 400 million yeah. and and then the last point you made I forgot uh, reducing water usage That's by right. almost 20 percent almost 20 percent and needless to say in this state and certainly in South Africa and a lot of other places today water 
mm. is becoming like gold, and, and we need that to survive and prosper. Okay, so you have further convinced me you're a good person to have on this guest to help us understand what Stanford has done. And I'd just like to start a basis for our understanding, but I, I want you to attack it if I'm not correct. Stanford probably has what's called a cogen plant when it started out. And yeah. I'll temp, try to define what a cogenerated co plant is one where we bring in some energy and we use that energy to do something, make electricity, power, or heating. But in that process of using that energy, we make heat, like uh, air conditioning, and we're blowing out the windows or into the room, out the windows, the heat. And a cogen energy system collects, may collect that heat or some of it, and then use that heat to, to do some more work as opposed to having to use energy to do that work. But mm -hmm. you are the expert. So I think that's, um, you know, that was a good, uh, a good start, a good definition. And so the energy that's, you mentioned there's energy that's brought into the system. Normally that's fossil fuels. Uh, so for cogeneration plants, which are quite common on campuses and uh, like for hospital facilities, et cetera, uh, most of them will burn natural gas. And so they uh, burn natural gas and at the cogeneration plant, it's called cogeneration because they're generating power and generating heat at the same time. And you mentioned where that heat, already where that heat comes from. When they're generating power, you typically uh, do that through a thermal process. For cogen, you do that through a thermal process and it generates a lot of waste heat. And so instead of just uh, discharging that waste heat into the environment, um, they collect it and use it to heat uh, buildings. And so that's the premise of a, a cogeneration system. It's also called combined heat and power, and which actually is a fairly efficient system for what it is, but nonetheless 100% um, based on fossil fuels. And fossil fuel is uh, natural gas. Yeah, you can burn other things, but typically, as, especially now with natural gas prices, what they are, that's what's being burned. Okay, so we have a sense of what a co-generation plant is, but I, a slight tangent. Uh, the system that Stanford ha has developed, uh, organizations that already that have multiple buildings and a co don't have a co-generation plant, are they a prospect for what the kind of system? Yes, uh, yeah, so I think there are kind of two situations, like you're, like you're saying. So in some cases, there's already a district energy system in place where a cogen system is within this category of so-called district energy, where you're clustering different buildings and instead of, instead of having appliances at each building providing heating and cooling, you have centralized, a centralized plant uh, that's serving that cluster or district. So cogen is within that category, um, but there are also cases where, you know, maybe a cogen system does not exist, but uh, a district energy approach could be valuable. And typically how you know whether a district energy system may be valuable is if um, there's a really high density of energy usage in the area. Uh, and in specific um, parts of towns that have research parks, for instance, or commercial campuses, mm -hmm. Um, those are probably good prospects, but it's actually a part of uh, this collaboration with Stanford in the City of Palo Alto Utilities uh, and then also the American Public Power Association where we're really trying to get at um, can we create uh, information and easy to use tools so that people in cities or people in different organizations can determine whether, whether their region is suitable. Okay, I think it's good if you define a district. Okay, and so a district um, really is a geographic perimeter uh, that's um, typically um, a cluster of buildings. Like it can be commercial buildings, like office buildings. It could also be um, hospitals, schools, industrial facilities. Uh, in some cases, district energy serves residential areas as well. Um, 
the central idea is that, uh, as we discussed before, instead of having individual building level appliances, um, you're increasing the efficiency of the system by centralizing the um, heating and cooling uh, production. And the, the money that you save from centralizing that heating and cooling production um, is what uh, causes it to be a more cost-effective, often, system. Okay, so could I say a, a district would be a certain area, yeah. some buildings, and there'd be something common. And having some central energy facility that's um, uh, generating the heat, heating and cooling that you're providing those buildings, you also have to have the network to actually deliver it. Uh, and so those are the, that's the other key components, the pipes, uh, yeah. basically, to deliver either steam or hot water or chilled water uh, to the system of buildings. And so in order to you know, uh, deploy this sort of system, often it is the case that it's um, either a situation where it's a university and you have the decision making kind of centralized or a corporate campus, same thing, or there's some other government uh, agency that's involved in the process, either by um, giving franchise rights to a private company to develop that utility, because it's a type of utility, um, or in some cases, building their own uh, utility. And so one of the reasons why Palo Alto is involved, um, and so they actually have all of their utilities are municipal. Um, electricity, gas, water, wastewater, refuse, and they also have a dark fiber network. And so they have a long history, uh, actually, of, of uh, building and operating and maintaining uh, utilities. And so this could be an additional utility. Okay. Now, now we go for the heavy stuff in a way. So we know what a cogen system is. And many utilities, many factories, many organiz big organizations are, have one. Okay. Centralized system. And that's what Stanford had. Now, what did Stanford, let's say, add, or how did they advance their cogen system to be able to generate a 70% increase, decrease in emissions and a, give me the number again for increase in energy efficiency. Well, the efficiency resulted in the 70% decrease in emissions. It's hard to identify a single number for efficiency because the systems are a bit different. Like for Cogen, they were also creating power on site. Yeah. For the new system, there are really two components to the new system that um, have enabled it to achieve those outcomes, renewable power and waste heat recovery. And so, yeah. So this new addition is it part of the cogen? No. So they completely decommissioned their cogen plant. Didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about the new system. Okay. So the new system is what I would describe as renewable electricity powered advanced heat renewable recovery. Renewable energy. They create their own renewable energy on site. So in so this case, it's actually grid supply. All right. PG&E. And that means simply 38% approximately coming from PG&E is clean. Well, it's funny you should mention that because it used to be PG&E, um, but now they're what's called a direct access customer. And so they actually have retail choice. Um, and so they, that's enabled them to uh, actually sign a number of uh, solar PPAs. And so they have a higher, um, a higher amount of renewable electricity uh, coming from utility scale solar. So it's not on campus. It's going remotely, and or it's located remotely. And PG&E is the distribution system uh, operator that's delivering that uh, that electricity to Stanford campus. Uh, but it is a remote situation, so it's actually remote renewable electricity powered uh, yeah. heat recovery on campus. And so somewhere out there, there's these solar systems, and they generate it maybe in Arizona, who knows? And then they pipe it in here, and PG&E has the a network with distribution. Okay, so that's where energy is coming from. That's the where, extent. yes, so that's where the, the system is powered from. So it's electrified. You could describe it as district electrification. And so that's where um, the energy is coming from. And what that energy is being used for is heat recovery. Um, and so they recognized, and, and they ended up, um, as I mentioned, they decommissioned their cogen plant. 
Uh, but before doing that, they considered a bunch of different options. And so they carried out a multi-year uh, analysis of their historical energy usage, heating and cooling loads, and electricity needs, uh, and um, evaluated a number of different system options, in including replacing it with just a new cogeneration plant. Um, but what they were able to achieve was result, a result of using heat pumps, uh, heat pumps to recover waste heat from the buildings that needed to be cooled uh, in order to serve the heating needs of the rest of the campus that needed that heat for hot water or for heating. I mean, it's often the case that if you're at a university, you have some, you know, you have some buildings that need to be cooled and some buildings that need to be heated. Uh, so th there's actually quite significant overlap in, in some of these needs. I, I want to ask this. I, I see two gigantic water tanks. I know one is cold and you mentioned distribution, you know, pipes. So Stanford put in these pipes and if building A needs to be cold, they use some energy to pump the cold water through the pipes into the building and that cool water, I guess, is involved in pulling the heat out, but energy was used to get that cold water, maybe to keep the water cold, and that energy, the burning of that, those fuels, created heat. And are you saying Stanford captures that heat and well, uses it? So in this case, so that was almost right, just until the last part. So they um, were able to generate uh, that chilled water um, using electric, uh, electric based equipment. And so that's where the renewable electricity comes in. Uh, and so they do have some boilers on site for backup purposes, but the vast majority of their energy needs uh, are coming from renewable electricity. And so there are kind of two different distribution networks, actually. One is a set of heating pipes that uh, serve every single building. And then also, in addition to the the pipe serving the building, there's actually also a pipe returning um, with, with the water after it's uh, served the, the heating needs of the building. Uh, and then there's also a cooling network, um, which you know, delivers chilled water to a building. And like you said, uh, when it's coming back, it's, it's warmer. And so Stanford is taking the return pipe from the chilled water system and extracting that heat to use for the hot water network, the heating network. So out goes cold water into a building to take the heat out. Yes. That water gets warm now or hot? Right. When it takes it out, the, the heat is coming from the building into the water. into the. And, and then warm water or hot water is returning? Then there's a pipe coming back that's, it's, I don't know how exactly, I'm actually not sure exactly how hot it is, but it's warmer than the chilled water pipe going to the building because it's collected the heat um, from that building that needed to be cooled. And that water then is used to meet the university's need for hot water. That's right. So the heat comes back to the central energy facility. So that's the facility that has all of the chillers that, that's creating the chilled water and the heat pumps. Um, and so through a heat pump system, they extract um, the heat from the cooled, chilled water return pipe and then they transfer it uh, to the, the heat, hot water system. The hot water, is that the big, a big tank? Or? Yeah, so they actually have three different storage tanks. One of them is orange colored, that's the hot water tank. Uh, and then there's also a couple different uh, chilled water uh, storage tanks. And so, yes, it's a system that has thermal storage, it has chillers, uh, and it also has uh, uh, heat pumps. Um, and that thermal storage actually allows them to load shift uh, significantly or optimize their energy usage uh, significantly to um, adapt to price changes on the grid. Uh, and so it, it enables them to be much more flexible and also resilient. They have around a half a day's uh, storage, I believe, through those tanks. Okay, now it goes, first of all, you're very clear, but this is an extremely complex system at least for lay people like me. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I mean, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> and what are you doing besides being here? 
helping to inform and educate. What are you doing to help? Uh, you're working to document, I think, uh, Stanford system. Mm -hmm. Could you put that in perspective, what you're doing and doing that? Um, so I helped put together a project that's uh, with Stanford and Palo Alto Utilities. And this is the same one with the American Public Power Association. It's actually funded by the American Public Power Association. Uh, and this project, uh, as you said, is documenting Stanford success. That's a component of it. So the first um, deliverable, if you want to call it that, or, or outcome is a case study. So Joe Stagner, who you had on the show, um, inter uh, excuse me, wrote down the entire process that, that he and his staff went through in determining that this was a really viable system option and also all the way through to deployment and lessons learned. So he documented that in a case study, um, which will help other people kind of help, uh, help them identify whether it might be a good system for them to consider. There's also a white paper. Uh, and so I, um, it's in the process of going through a peer review, uh, but I put together a white paper. Uh, you mentioned it's a complex topic. I think people in the energy sector even don't necessarily have a background in district energy. So this white paper is geared toward uh, someone who is maybe working at a municipal utility or at a city government, and it goes through kind of the basics of what is district energy, um, what are the renewable sources uh, of heat that can be used in a system? Uh, how do you uh, determine whether the economics will make sense? Um, and what are some other uh, barriers? And so this is a white paper that tries to uh, clearly and concisely uh, describe the situation and encourage others to, uh, to follow. What are you going to develop, if anything, to help people do feasibility studies and Mm. Anything? Yes, yes. And so I think part of it is the Stanford case study and the white paper that provides more just the information. But then as you're pointing out, you know, they need to, what are they going to do? Even if they read the white paper and decide they, they want to see whether it is a, a viable system type, uh, what they can do is actually take um, uh, some tools uh, that we're compiling uh, to carry out feasibility assessments. We want to make it as easy as possible for uh, anyone, other universities, municipal sure. utilities, uh, companies, to be able to determine whether it's a good option for them. That's wonderful. And I think I can see it's the kind of project that can help California attain goal number two of its climate change plan, and that is to double the energy efficiency of existing buildings. In a way, I wish I was doing the project because I think if you can help double the energy efficiency savings of the state of California alone, you are making a great contribution. So, ladies and gentlemen, my guest has been Amy Bailey, and she is a researcher at the huge French organization Energy of France. And I want to thank you for watching. I am Michael Kilman.